Okay. I think we've given everyone enough time to come in. Um, welcome everyone to this live fully active webinar brought to you by the Monroe County Bar Center for Education and Greater Rochester Association of Women Attorneys and the Rochester Black Bar Association. <clears throat> Today is September 9th, 2021, and this critical race theory in schools, what it is, what it is not, and why it matters hosted by the Lawyers Coalition, Coalition for Racial and Social Justice. To comply with accreditation regulations, please fill out your affirmation form and evaluation sheet at the end of the program and email back to Daniel Matahas. In exchange, you will receive certificate of attendance after the program via email. Please note that all attorneys must attend the program in its entirety to receive credit. According to New York State Continuing Legal Education Board, CLE provides, providers are prohibited from issuing partial credit. All right. Now, as far as this program, I wanna welcome everyone to discuss uh, critical race theory. Um, this is a hot button topic right now, um, even though CRT for short, is a decades old um, academic framework that scholars use to interrogate how the legal systems as well as other societal elements uh, perpetuate racism and exclusion. Uh, the latest boogeyman um, has galvanized both national and local um, political activists um, who oppose teaching about um, the impact of racism um, that racism has um, on the U.S. past and also present. So as such, uh, my name is Dwayne Bosco. I will be the moderator for the CLE. And we have a tremendous panel here with us. Uh, <clears throat> Janelle George, who is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University, civil rights attorney who has written and lectured about critical race theory and racial stratification and inequity in US education. Yolanda Asamoa, um, who's a Rochester City School District Special Education Council, whose focus includes compliance, policy development, and program design initiatives. Brandy Blocker Anderson, uh, the law, who is an attorney, educator, uh, DEI consultant, and founder of the Anti-Racism Academy, as well as Shane Wigan, who is a fourth grade teacher in Rush Henrietta and co-lead of the uh, Anti-Racist Curriculum Project at Past Stones Foundation. Welcome, everyone. So to begin, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelist, Janelle George who's going to go through what CRT is and what it isn't. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you so much, Duane. And thank you everyone for joining today uh, and for being willing to engage in this discussion. Uh, talking about these issues of racial inequality are always really difficult and uncomfortable. Uh, so that I really hope that we can recognize that and, and to the degree we all can embrace it, right? Embrace the challenge of it uh, as we all learn more about critical race theory. And I look forward to uh, just engaging in this conversation with you today. Uh, so as was noted, I'm uh, Associate Professor of Law, Georgetown University Law Center. And I'm also the director of a clinic called the Racial Equity in Education Law and Policy Clinic. So issues like those that we're discussing today uh, are among the many issues that I engage in uh, with students. So obviously we've all heard about critical race theory. It has been front and center in a lot of the news and debates and politics shows. Uh, but I will very briefly just cover some of the origins of critical race theory 
Uh, secondly, what are features? What are some features and tenets of critical race theory? And then I want to close out by just talking about the social context that we're in right now and take a look back at a similar social context of massive resistance that followed the Brown versus Board of Education ruling. But let's start with what critical race theory actually is. And in order to understand what critical race theory is, we have to take a couple of steps back and look at some prior legal movements. Uh, so bear with me now, this is going to feel a little bit like a law class. Um, you all will earn that CLE, uh, but we will get to the other side. So uh, there were legal realists uh, who were actually very groundbreaking for their time because what they did is they departed from this widespread assumption that the law was impartial, uh, that it was objective. The legal realists said, no, we actually have to consider law within the social and political context, that we have to look at decisions that are made within those contexts, and the judges actually can be influenced uh, by those contexts. So they, this was very groundbreaking at the time. They were followed by the critical uh, legal studies folks, or they were also known as the crits. The crits actually said, not only is the law not objective, it actually maintained an unjust social order, right? And the law also naturalizes this unjust social order so that even people who are subordinated by the law think that it's fair and impartial. And so they were also uh, pretty groundbreaking. But then they went a step further and the critical legal studies folks of the crits said, the, the only way to address this and address the role that the law is, is playing is actually destabilizing the authority of the law. Because if it's, if it's naturalizing this unjust social order, then we have to destabilize the law's authority. Well, you had some other folks, right? Like the late Harvard law professor, Derek Bell, who had worked as an attorney, a civil rights attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who said, wait, oh, wait a minute. Um, you know, I've seen, yes, the law, can oppress and subordinate folks, but I've also seen it used as a tool for emancipation. Uh, if the law has done powerful things for the vulnerable. And by the way, crits aren't recognizing issues related to race or how the law is reproducing racial inequality. So we also have another, the founder, actually who coined the term critical race theory, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a professor of law at uh, Columbia Law in UCLA and is president of the African-American Policy Forum. Uh, she sought to understand along with other founders of critical race theory, what is the role of the law in, in deepening racial inequality or reproducing it in a post-civil rights era? So even though we have the Civil Rights Act and we have Brown versus Board of other Education, these other civil rights victories, how is the law replicating racial inequality? And, and Crenshaw, who coined this term, again, critical race theory, notes that it's a verb, it's not a noun. It's a way of examining the role of law and policy in reproducing this inequality. Uh, it really originated in the late 70s. There was a huge gathering in the 80s that really mobilized uh, critical race theory. And you had other uh, founders, Richard Delgado, Dean Stefancic, Mari Matsuda, Patricia Wood. Williams and many others uh, who led this movement. Now, I know that that's a departure from the idea of like a static theory, like a mathematical theory, but legal theorists seek to understand the interactions between law and society. So there are a few features of critical race theory that I just want to cover. The first is that race is not biologically real, but it is socially real. And those, your perceived race has consequences, social consequences for how folks interact with you. So there was this human genome project in the 1990s that actually revealed that we all share 99.999% of the same genes. Now, there are some who make a huge deal out of that 0.001. 
we share <laughs> the, the majority of the same genes. So while race is not genetically real, it really has social consequences. And I love this quote uh, from Berkeley Law Professor Kiera Bridges, who notes um, that race has never been solely about bodies. It has always been about what those bodies mean in terms of mental, emotional, and political capabilities, right? So that goes against this idea. A lot of uh, anti-critical race theory folks are saying things like uh, critical race theory is um, making, uh, dividing people by race. No, actually critical race theory uh, uh, purports this idea that, again, race is not biologically real. A second uh, tenet or feature is that racism is normal. It's not a barren. It's not, we all think of this kind of outlier as a racist or as somebody who's like foaming at the mouth of racist. No, racism is actually a normal feature of American society. Um, I would love it if we truly were a racial society, uh, but that's just not the reality of it. And actually being unconscious about race is the very thing that contributes to the reproduction of racial inequality, right? Uh, particularly in this post-civil rights era. So Gloria Ladson Billings, who does a lot of work on critical race theory in the education context, talks about conceptual categories of race. And I know that some of the other panelists will talk more about the education context, but think about this, which she poses. When you think of a quote unquote at-risk school, what race are you assuming the students are? When you think of a quote unquote bad school, what race are you assuming the students are? These are these kind of conceptual categories that we have about race. And finally, and, and this is really important, is that systems and institutions can do the bulk of reproducing racial inequality. Again, we're not just focusing on individual bad actors, but how can a system like the legal system actually reproduce racial inequality? So critical race theory assumes that the law is not merely regulating race and race relations, but that it's actively constituting race in these relations between various races. And again, I know that this is a huge departure from how we all traditionally think about race, right? It's this idea, uh, and a lot of us also have difficulty thinking, how can a system or an institution be racist? I know the other panelists will delve into some more examples, Right, but thinking about how a policy or a law can have di a disproportionate impact on people of color. If we think about the perpetuation of housing segregation, for example, there were actually, the federal government was very active in, in perpetuating housing segregation, allowing realtors to draw red lines around black uh, neighborhoods, areas where black families live and giving those areas lower property valuation so that other people, namely white people, would not move to those areas, that has perpetuated uh, property poor, racially segregated uh, neighborhoods and areas, which has repercussions for segregated schools as well. So what's also important for us to think about, I want us to think in terms of the current context that we're in, is that these, this anti-critical race theory movement or effort is orchestrated. So this is a quote from uh, conservative activist Christopher Rufo. And what he says is, um, we have successfully frozen their brand, which by the way, critical race theory wasn't really a brand, but um, critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural uh, insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. 
So this is intentional. And if we really examine the moment, let's take a step back to around this time last year or, or June of 2020. The world was experiencing a racial reckoning in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. It was worldwide. So this is a demonstration from the UK. This is here. We had this worldwide racial reckoning and companies were talking about systemic racism and making pledges to end it. And then we had increased political participation by people of color in the historic 2020 election. So what we're really seeing then all of a sudden in the fall of 2020, uh, namely in September when uh, former President Trump issued an executive order uh, banning or condemning critical race theory, that's when we've seen this action and really a backlash to the racial reckoning and the political participation. And by the way, there's no, it's not a coincidence that we're seeing efforts to restrict voting rights at this very same time that we're seeing all of these anti-critical uh, race theory bills, right? Critical race theory is, is not taught in K through 12 schools. Now, some features of critical race theory, for example, the uh, uh, addressing racism through how it's perpetuated through systems uh, might be employed by educators. Uh, I wish it were actually taught in K through 12 education. I know that some other panelists will talk more about what they're doing in the education system, but just to share with you also, this is one critical race theory reader. Um, it's huge. Um, this, this is hard for even advanced K through 12 students to get. I wish there was an advanced placement critical race theory course. I'd be happy to teach it, um, but there's none that I'm aware of. But as you can see with some of the tenets of critical race theory, it can teach us a lot about racism and how it's actually uh, reproduced. But what we're seeing is a co-opting of the language of the civil rights movement, right? This wording that critical race theory is, is racist. Uh, one scholar called this like political blackface, right? Um, but if we think back, so there was this era known as massive resistance after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the 1954 case of Brown versus Be Board of Education in validating uh, this doctrine of separate but equal. We saw widespread resistance to the ruling. A lot of people don't talk about Brown too, which was in 1955, in which the court ordered districts to desegregate with all deliberate speed which they interpreted to mean no speed at all. And so we actually saw concerted effort. So if we take a look forward, right? So we see some similarities. And again, the language, the, the uh, adoption of the language um, between massive resistance and critical race theory. And I just wanna flag these because I work on legislation and I think we really have to be mindful of, of some of the similar tactics that are being employed. So what really triggered massive resistance was this signing by Southern congressmen of what's called the Southern Manifesto, uh, which vowed to, they in which these congressmen vowed to pass laws in opposition to the Brown ruling. And they use key tactics, the withdrawing of state funds from integrated schools, uh, which was later invalidated. This was used in particular in Virginia, um, creating new all white schools using public funds. Let's think about where we might see this now, right? Where we see the use of public funds for racially segregated education. These were known at the time as segregation academies and even the closing of public schools to avoid desegregation. Uh, in Prince Edward County, which is not too far from where I live in Virginia, they closed down their public schools for five years five years to avoid desegregation, right? And it's easy to think, oh, that's like so far in the past, we've really moved on from that. But think again about Virginia passes laws to cut off state funding uh, and closing school, any schools that integrate. This is one example of a bill in South Carolina. By the way, 20, as of August, end of August, early September, 27 states have introduced bills or other measures to either restrict the teaching of critical race theory 
or how limit how racism or sexism are taught in the classroom. 12 states have enacted uh, such bans. So you have South Carolina, right, which introduces uh, a provision in their budget um, to cut state funds to schools or districts if they're used, and this wording is a little vague, right, to teach that certain races uh, or sexes are superior to others or that individuals have certain traits, experiences, or responsibilities because of their race. Now, in, in the world of public policy, vagueness is almost fatal, right? What does that mean? Who, who is aware of what's allowable, what's not allowable? That's a huge problem. And virtually anyone can enforce this. It can be a teacher, a parent, a school leader. Some folks are talking about putting uh, body cameras on educators. And, and the consequences are huge. Arizona passed a law that would fine a district $5,000 they had an earlier proposal that would find teachers $5,000. That didn't make it, but the, it, the law did pass to find school districts. And imagine an underfunded school district being fined uh, $5,000. So this is huge, right? Couple other similarities I wanna flag. Um, Parent-led organizations played a huge role in massive resistance. You see parent-led organizations playing a huge role now. And these are white parent-led organizations. Here in this slide, there's actually a black person strategically placed here. So they've gotten a little bit more you know, thoughtful in terms of tactics, but these are mainly white parent-led uh, efforts, as you can see, uh, even looking right at these photos here. So on the left, this was a parent protest uh, as Ruby Bridges, who was six, year old, six years old, uh, integrated in New Orleans public school. Uh, and the casket is a baby doll and the face is actually painted black. Uh, and people threatened to kill her. And then on the right, this is uh, Loudoun County in Virginia, a uh, school board meeting uh, that actually got violent. I think one person was arrested. Um, and so we just have to be mindful of the moment that we're in. And I'm not saying this to be dramatic. Um, I know that there are folks who have concerns about curriculum who say that they are nothing like these, these other parents post-Brown, but we really have to be mindful of the moment and pay attention to the tactics that are being used. I wanna close with just a couple of things. Um, Brian Stevenson, who's the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, always talks about how students in Germany uh, are required to learn about the Holocaust, not to cast Germans as bad people, but so they are aware of the conditions that led to it. This is the uh, uh, memorial in Berlin to victims of the Holocaust. And James Baldwin, uh, a prolific writer, he made a speech called A Talk to Teachers in 1963. And I'll just end with a quote from him. It's not really a black revolution that is upsetting the country. What is upsetting the country is a sense of its own identity. If, for example, one managed to change the curriculum in all the schools so that black students learn more about themselves and their real contributions to this culture, you would be liberating not only black students, you'd be liberating white people who know nothing about their own history. So I hope that we can think uh, just of those words that are so pr really prophetic for the moment that we're in. And I look forward to uh, talking more with you all. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. And I, I had to mention, if you have questions, feel free to submit your questions um, at any point in time. We'll get to your questions at the conclusion of the panelist presentation. Next up, we have Yolanda Asamoa. Yolanda. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to thank uh, my fellow panelists also for this wonderful opportunity to dialogue. And I also would like to thank the audience that's out there. So um, I am uh, I'm an educator as well as an attorney. I, I have been a K-12 teacher 
um, and uh, then went to law school and became uh, an attorney. And I currently practice education law with the Rochester City School District in Rochester, New York. I was very excited to be asked to uh, join this panel. Um, and uh, I really had to think long and hard about, um, you know, how I might be able to bring something to the conversation uh, that would be somewhat separate and distinct, but continue uh, this conversation all at the same time. I will ask that you bear with me. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I struggled a little bit with some of the technology with embedding things, but I think we'll be fine. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. My sound. Okay. Can you see my screen? Hi, Yolanda, not yet. Have you, you pressed the green button at the bottom? I did. Let's try it again. <clears throat> there we go. I thought I did. I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see the screen now? There we go. So <clears throat> does the question, uh, you know, uh, is, is abounding now as to whether or not this uh, discussion really has a place in K-12 um, public education. Um, this discussion, I think, resounds pretty loudly now in uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, law programs, and the like but uh, it is causing a very heated debate as uh, Janelle uh, indicated in the K-12 um, public education sector. The fact of the matter is, is that when you get to the heart of things uh, around critical race theory, you begin to uncover and peel back the onion on race and the extent to which racism uh, is embedded in our systems, all of our systems and the education system is not excluded from that. Uh, in the United States, uh, children are more likely to read, write, and do math on grade level if they are white than if they are uh, students of color. Um, we know that many students of color have uh, fewer effective teachers um, and fewer opportunities to do grade level work uh, and enroll in advanced classes. Many students of color have never had a single teacher of color during their K-12 career. Um, and the opportunity to attend school at all can sometimes depend on the color of your skin. There are so many other examples, but we know that students of color are suspended at a disproportionately higher rate than uh, uh, students uh, who are Caucasian. <laughs> I love this picture. When you stand on the precipice of a gulf like this, your breath is taken away. Um, it's a divide, it's a chasm. You feel that you can fall. Uh, and this debate has really fueled so much division in this country that I think we do ourselves and our students a disservice if we don't allow them to dialogue this debate. <clears throat> and the, it's pretty amazing to me uh, the divergence in opinions and the difference in perspectives around this debate. I'd like to play a couple of clips that just show that for you. I think this was the... Uh, should probably stop showing my screen so you don't see all my minutes, <laughs> but here we go. Brittany Hogan thought she made it as the highest ranking black woman in her school district. But this year Yolanda, so we're still seeing the presentation, not the video. I apologize. So you might want to stop your screen share and then go in again and, and share the environment. It's really hard to focus on what matters, so that's really
Okay, so I've temporarily stopped the sharing so you can go back in and share your web browser. Thank you. Can you see the, uh, the, the, the web browser now? Thank you very much. Brittany Hogan thought she made it as the highest ranking black woman in her school district. But this year it's turned into a really hostile environment. It's been really hard to focus on what matters and that's really making sure that the kids are well. Hogan led diversity and equity programs in the Rockwood School District just outside of St. Louis. But last spring, in the midst of the American uprising over George Floyd's murder, parents accused Hogan of pushing critical race theory. Does the district teach critical race no. theory? No. Rockwood does not teach critical race theory. It's a decades-old study on systemic racism, almost exclusively taught in law school. I feel this is culturally sanctioned discrimination. The resistance got so severe, the district hired private security. Being told that my work is ungodly and immoral questioning my credentials, questioning my ability to be here and to do this work, um, calling me a liar, saying I'm uh, racist against white people, screenshots that were being sent to me consistently. Um, it looked like a lot of just mean, very hurtful things. Hogan decided to leave her dream job. It was heartbreaking. It was giving up the work that I really loved. Dr. Terry Harris was Hogan's boss, and he made a different choice to stay and fight in this district that serves 22,000 children and is 75% white. Was part of you staying on because you just don't want them to win? Because if I leave, then I'm not advocating for all students anymore. So do you believe that a reconciliation is possible? 100%. I think that we can restore this. Someone has to believe that their education is going to be effective, is going to be fair and just. Parents who called for Hogan and Dr. Harris's firing declined NBC News's request for an interview. Rockwood's administrators make the curriculum public online and have repeatedly told parents they don't teach critical race theory. Black parents are worried as a new year starts without Hogan. I'm the only black person in my class. They are running her away because she was only doing her job. Is there something to be said for fighting the good fight? I'm still fighting the good fight. Making the decision was really a choice of choosing myself, but also knowing that I'm still committed to the work, that I'm still committed to being a person who talks about race and equity. It doesn't stop just because I left Rockwood. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, Rockwood, Missouri. We thank Antonia for that. And, and on the other side of the coin, was everybody able to hear that audio okay? Thank you. On the other side of the coin. <clears throat> Oops, I apologize. Here we go. Before you pray. Um, I'm going to just uh, because I don't want to take too much time fumbling here with the uh, with the audio. Um, but there is uh, an Asian author um, who um, argues that uh, Asians have been left out of the critical race uh, theory uh, debate, um, and that that has been unfairly so, and that uh, in fact um, the reason why we experience or we tend to focus on African-American um, or other people of color when we have this discussion uh, is because somehow they do not merit being on this stage, that Asians are being overlooked um, and because they, they are able to achieve. Uh, and the reason being is that they have closer knit families, uh, they have a harder work ethic, 
uh, and things like that. So, um, you know, the, the gulf is tremendous in, in this entire uh, debate. And uh, I think that it's really healthy to have the discussion in such a way that we are healing in the process and bringing people together. So going back now to uh, my presentation. <clears throat> Some would say, what's in a name? As uh, Shakespeare put it, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In some of the materials that uh, you received prior to the beginning of the presentation, uh, you may have read uh, that there are those who argue that there is no similarity um, between critical race theory and other terms that we um, utilize in the education world, such as culturally responsive teaching, student-centered learning, problem-based learning, or critical thinking. Um, and what I'd like to put to you is that, uh, in fact, um, that is not necessarily the case. If you provide students an opportunity to explore their lived experience, to peel back the onion, and to question things that are important to them, you will eventually arrive at critical race theory. And so uh, I feel that uh, these, all of these terms are interchangeable and that the uh, names that we utilize are actually what divide us. Um, so for example, a child might ask, mommy, why does everybody have a gun? Daddy, why do I have to wear a mask? Daddy, why can't I get vaccinated like my other friends? Mommy, why do so many of my friends and family have to die? Uh, this, you know, uh, unearths the questions around um, how race has impacted the collective health of communities of color. Um, how many times do we ask these questions ourselves? And I really have to stop and, and, and ponder why we wouldn't want to feed that same curiosity amongst our K through 12 students. And why wouldn't we want to do so aggressively? Just ask yourself how many questions you Google today and how many iterations of the same question did you Google? How many hits did you bypass and why? Which ones did you seize on and why? When did you stop and why did you stop? Uh, we all go through the process of trying to understand our lived experience every day. Um, and um, Google has actually become one of those tools that we utilize frequently to do so. We should be giving children the same opportunity to explore their own lived experience. In the words of Dr. Malefi Keti Asante, what could be any more correct for any people than to see with their own eyes? Um, I am uh, personally from Ghana, West Africa. Sankofa is an Adinkra symbol. Uh, and in the Akan uh, language, it means to go back and get it. Um, the image of the bird uh, holding an egg and pulling it from behind it to bring it forward um, symbolizes the importance of our knowing history and that our and allowing our children to quest for knowledge is an extremely important part of human development. And for our children, it is critical. Children come alive when they are engaged. Children are interested in the material they are learning when they are engaged. What better way to engage our students than to teach them how to find and explore their own lived experience, as well as to teach them how we share experiences. We are all in this together. Um, when, if anybody's interested after the presentation is over, uh, this is a clip that I uh, pulled by an artist named Michael Franti. Um, and he, he's written a song that says that he's just one in one billion in this world trying to keep the lights on. He wrote this song post-COVID to discuss and um, uh, share what is actually a shared experience that we've all had coming through this pandemic. And uh, I think that it's very important that children understand that we are different, but we have a lot of similarities and we need to understand what those similarities are. 
How do we move the work forward in K-12 public education? Uh, well, it is a slow and long process. A good friend of mine who I believe is probably watching tonight, Jerome Underwood, um, explained to me uh, that you know he has been in the trenches uh, in K-12 education trying to move this work. Um, and we can't force it. Uh, there's going, you have to have conflict before you have peace. We're going to just have to dig in and do the work. Um, Dr. Joy DeGroy says that, you know, people are free to come and free to go. They should be able to voluntarily engage in this dialogue, voluntarily come to professional development um, uh, sessions until they can embrace it themselves. Because if you try to force this on folks, it's not going to work. This is going to be a long process. However, once you come to the table, you do need to participate in the healing. So I think professional development in K-12 education is a critical component of moving this work forward um, and um, just continuing to talk about it as well. Yolanda, I'm sorry, I just wanna interrupt really quick. Your PowerPoint is not up. Do you mean for it to be shared? It did. Thank you. Oh, Chris. Here we go. I am still not seeing it. Um, and you know what? I, I will just um, read from it. It will be, and I'll provide it for um, for everyone uh, that you can, so you can disseminate it to the participants. But I'm only I only have one or two slides left to go. Okay, thank, thank you so much. much. I don't want to hold us up. So as I was saying, um, you know, this is a slow and long process. As well, we're going to need to really work with our policymakers and our legislators. Um, in the words of Heather McGee, racism holds the pen of the leg legislature. We do need to elect officials who are going to be able to move this work forward and for whom this is an important and critical agenda. <clears throat> um, when I was uh, doing my uh, education administration studies, um, one of the... Um, courses or the components of a lecture that really stuck with me were the three P's, policy, practice, and procedure. Um, we really, once the demand is there, then it's up to school boards and school officials to establish their vision. And if you're going to move this work forward, then that would need to be a vision of equity, inclusion, equality, culturally responsive teaching, uh, and um, enact policy that follows and is aligned to that vision, improve practices through professional development and staff training, and finally develop procedure. But none of this can be done if you don't have the groundswell, if you don't have the demand, uh, and you don't have the constituents that are willing and uh, interested in doing this work and moving it forward. That would be all. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank, Thank you. Yolanda. At this point in time, I'll give the first code for the CLE and we'll also place it in the chat. The first code is 9227. That's 9227. At this point, we'll, also, we'll turn it over to Brandy Blocker Anderson, who will discuss uh, the national perspective of what happens when uh, you introduce race or teach race, teach about racism in the classroom. Brandy. Thank you so much. And can one of my fellow panelists give me a thumbs up if I'm all set? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all so much for, for having um, us this evening. So um, as Duane said, I'm gonna be talking a bit about the response to um, teaching critical race theory in the classroom. But first, I'll just briefly tell you a bit about myself. So uh, like Yolanda, I am a, a teacher turned attorney as well. Um, I taught at a school taught called Sankofa Freedom Academy Charter School. So I'm um, very much deeped in the tradition of African-centered pedagogy, uh, which is in part which 
um, has brought me out of the corporate legal world into this work as a diversity, equity, inclusion um, consultant. And so my hope is really to take a lot of the stuff that um, Professor George talked about and bring a lot of that good knowledge out of the academy and, and really to the block, to the classroom, to the streets, um, in places where, where it isn't currently. Um, so, uh, just to sort of uh, frame up, uh, frame up how we're going to spend the next about 15 minutes. Um, the guiding questions will be: So, what is racist propaganda? So, my I'm positing here to answer Yolanda's question: Like, why is it that we wouldn't want to teach kids about these things? Um, so, my answer is that this is all a part of a, a larger. Um, a larger program or campaign of, of racist propaganda around critical race theory. So we'll, we'll answer first the question, what is racist propaganda? And then talk specifically about how this backlash, this national um, reaction to critical race theory is an example of racist propaganda. And then we'll talk about some strategies for what we as parents and educators can do in order to fight back against this backlash against critical race theory specifically, but really this larger backlash against anti-racist, um, pedagogy in schools and, and then we'll save Q&A for after after uh, all the panelists conclude. Okay, so I'm just going to play a very brief clip from my favorite uh, propaganda machine, uh, Fox News, and my favorite host, Tucker Carlson, um, as he discusses uh, everyone's favorite, um, I guess, pundit around these issues, Chris Rufo. So tonight we've asked Chris Rufo to walk us through some of what is happening here. You should know the details. Rufo is a research fellow at the Discovery Institute as well as a contributing editor at City Journal, and he joins us now. Chris Rufo, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. You know, Tucker, this is something I've been investigating for the last six months, and it's absolutely astonishing how critical race theory has pervaded every institution in the federal government. And what I've discovered is that critical race theory has become, in essence, the default ideology of the federal bureaucracy and is now being weaponized against the American people. I'd like to share three investigations that I've unleashed uh, that show the kind of depth of this critical race theory, occult indoctrination, uh, and the danger and destruction it can wreak. Uh, first, the Treasury Department. Uh, I broke the story on the Treasury Department, which held uh, a, a seminar uh, earlier this year uh, from a man named Howard Ross, a, a diversity trainer who has billed the federal government more than $5 million over the past 15 years, uh, conducting seminars on critical race theory. Uh, and he told Treasury employees essentially that America was a fundamentally a white supremacist country. And I quote, virtually all white people uphold the system of racism and white superiority and was essentially denouncing the country and asking white employees at the Treasury Department and affiliated organizations uh, to accept their white privilege, uh, accept uh, their white uh, racial superiority, uh, and accept uh, essentially uh, all of the uh, baggage that comes uh, with this reducible essence of whiteness. All right, I'll stop it there. And so it's funny because between all of the alarmist rhetoric, there's a lot of truth in it. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, acknowledge your white privilege. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Um, but just to, to, to go back to the definition, or at least our working definition for the purpose of this discussion. So the idea of racist propaganda, I think we traditionally think about it um, in terms of like, um, Nazi Germany imagery, uh, like racist cartoons and things like that. Um, but propaganda takes many forms. And one of the forms is in just uh, messaging and co the co-optation of terms that once had a, a positive meaning or a meaning that was liberatory for folks who were working to undo the effects of racism and then using it to um, get people sort of up in arms to kind of undo a lot of the progress that we've made around this racial reckoning that we've had in our country. So, um, like Professor George, I want to also bring uh, to the front um, uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who, as was mentioned, coined the term and what her response to this backlash has been. To answer this question, like, like how, how exactly is this backlash against critical race theory an example of racist propaganda? And so, again, racist propaganda being... Um, misleading and biased messaging used to promote racism and white supremacy so as, as, a, as a broad framework so we'll play just a, a brief clip from here we said we've successfully frozen their brand 
critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions, we will eventually turn it toxic as we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand category. To wit, Fox News has mentioned critical race theory nearly 1,300 times in the past three and a half months. And we've now discovered that a lot of these parents that are showing up at school boards uh, inveighing against their children being taught that they're, you know, racist, turns out they are actually Republican activists, not just regular old parents. Um, Big talk, surprise there, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it is not not surprising at all. Uh, so I guess I, I guess my last question to you would be, what do you worry is 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 sort of the purpose of what they're trying to do? Because this is political. It is about getting out the white you know voters in 2022. Is there a bigger risk uh, to naming critical race theory as a, some sort of Marxist plot? Well, of course. I mean, the, the, the biggest risk is that this tried and true framing of anti-racism as racist against white people is going to win again. It won at the end of the Civil War when civil rights were framed as reverse discrimination against white people. It won after Brown versus Board of Education when integration was framed as damaging uh, white children. And it could win now if people don't wake up and have a sense of what's at stake. So yeah, you're going to hear all these stories, cherry pick stories. Turns out a lot of them were not verifiable that, that the other other side is putting out there. You're not going to hear, and you should, what is happening with these bands. You're not going to hear that an essay by Ta-Nehisi Coates was the reason why a school teacher was fired. You're not going to hear about the affinity groups in, in colleges and universities and the programs, the educational programs yeah. um, that are, are being canceled. So we need to see materially what this is doing in order to weigh into this. If anyone was mobilized by last year, if anyone is concerned about what they saw on January 6th, then yeah. you are on our side with this and you need to get involved. All right. So, and so when we think about what this backlash is, like, yes, uh, so critical race theory has been around for a long time, but um, there's definitely some, 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 some touch points in the national zeitgeist for why now. So, of course, we know this has been used as a political linchpin. So I guess now that gay marriage is off the table and I guess bathrooms aren't as much of a hot topic, we have critical race theory as the new sort of um, rallying cry. And so at the, at the center, though, we have some some key figures, one being um, journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, who was one of the, the lead writers, journalists, who put together the 1619 Project um, back in 2019 to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the first documented African uh, to be brought here as an enslaved person um, in the uh, early American colonies. Um, and so that project went from a long form um, piece in the New York Times to being actually rolled out as curriculum. And so that being is one example of like what they're what they are talking about as far as this uh, boogeyman of race being taught in the classroom. Um, and so myself as a as, as a smaller blip on this on, on this in this national um, narrative, um, my company and a number of others were highlighted as doing this work um, of wanting to bring and, and teach and help parents and teachers teach kids about race. And so the story was picked up by the Washington Post. And within a, a week, we had Breitbart, we got picked up by Breitbart News, as well as the Daily Mail, which, uh, if you're not familiar, are extreme right wing propagandist um, uh, news vehicles. So I had to politely ask the Daily Mail to please take my son down off their website. Okay, thanks. Um, but thinking about like what it is that we can do um, in the classrooms and what they're trying, they being you know these conservative uh, pundits and, and 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 propagandists, is prevent us from having this truthful conversation. And so I pull just some of these nuggets. I think Instagram is a wonderful place uh, for folks who are looking for materials for their classrooms and for even to share with their, their students. There's so many accounts to follow, hashtags around anti-racism, anti-racist parenting and teaching that will uh, bring up so much of this great stuff. So one quote being, if you, un if you wanna understand 
any problem in America, you need to focus on who pro profits from the problem, not who suffers from that problem. And so what we have uh, with this current dialogue around critical race theory is this focus on the truth tellers as the problem, quote unquote. So trying to fire teachers and um, weaponize parents against um, educators who are trying to just simply tell the truth about history um, as being labeled as a problem when in reality the problem is our history of white supremacy that to this day we still have not fully reckoned with. And so, and this is and this is a huge tool of of oppression. So if you you keep people um, ignorant about their history, that is a that that is a way to continue to oppress them and continue to allow uh, oppressive systems to to be perpetuated. And so I have down here in the corner just this. I thought it was a funny quote from. Uh, Trevor Noah of The Daily Show uh, from Juneteenth, because as we know this year, Juneteenth was made into a federal holiday. And so this, this says, a happy Juneteenth, the first U.S. holiday. It's illegal to teach about in 15 states. And I'm sure that number is higher now. But just the irony around like whether or not we want to be like honest or hypocritical do we want to have real conversations or do we want to just do window dressing and say we're you know we're not racist slavery happened um actually we spent so much longer enslaved than we still have out, out outside of slavery just in terms of the grand scheme of american history but this history of erasure would have you think otherwise and the last thing i wanted to call out here is just this this what what it would look like if we were teaching critical race theory in the classroom so so often we hear this beautiful story that brown v boer came and just made everything better Better, but we don't hear about those cases like Professor George's after uh, Professor George mentioned afterwards that um, you know after Brown two the kind of like that 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 shift back the other way saying you know we actually we're not going to do anything about um, you know de facto segregation like, we don't have anything to do with that um, like you know, that 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 history of redlining and all of that we can't we can't really understand all the factors why a Detroit school for example or a Philadelphia school or a Rochester school for example would be racially segregated in the way that we could for a school down in Alabama so you know we're done um, with this whole. Um, desegregation thing and I think had I had that education in school I would understood I would have understood why I went to a segregated school even as we're learning about this beautiful history of Ruby Bridges and how brave she was to go and integrate her school um, and so just another just one more example um, or two more examples of just like what we're talking about when 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 we're doing this in the classroom or in a way where that kids can understand so instead of teaching this beautiful lily white history these wonderful fa founding fathers who loved history let's you know unpack what it means that you know so many of these people also owned people and like the cognitive dissonance around what it means to say one thing on paper and do something else in real life. Um, and then just larger conversation around language. Like when we talk about my ancestors, do not call them slaves, okay? E uh, we're, we're talking about enslaved African people, enslaved people, people first language. Um, and, and if we're talking about people who self-emancipated, then they self-emancipated, no runaway slave business. And so that is how we start to infuse this in the classrooms. But to go back to um, Yolanda's point, you know, why, why will we not? <laughs> why, why, wh who, who does this benefit to continue to valorize slaveholders and uphold people like Christopher Columbus and continue to debase people who, you know, the, through their lives, you know, having to be enslaved were already debased. Um, and so just to bring um, another example around what's already been mentioned, that this is a part of a concerted campaign, like people are being paid and organized to galvanize parents around this. So this graphic I pulled from a 51 page dossier that was put together by No Left Turn, which is a right wing think tank that is actually give, producing cheat sheets for how to give uh, parents and um, educators the, the words and 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 the and the shorthand for how to recognize when it's happening because most people could, couldn't define critical race theory or name it if they heard it they just know oh I hear the word race in it that you know any anything like that so this graphic is you know telling people you know when they say inclusion. <laughs> Or when they say, so critical race theory, for example, what they mean is race-centered thinking. And then you go all the way up um, 
I mean, in most of these things, I actually agree with that. The idea that racism is baked into the system and is in inescapable. I mean, I view it as a, as a challenge and not as a, you know, a with with so much finality. But um, some of these others are just like you, you see the clear bias. So when we say decolonization, removing of European influence, not necessarily, it, but it means that that shouldn't be the only influence there is in recognizing that, yes, that is the lens that we're using. So one thing that we can do is resist the narratives. Um, this, all, all, all of this could be remedied so much by just a educating yourself and like learning these skills of how to be a critical thinker um, and, and, and listening to those loaded words and all these tools that we should be learning and teaching our, our, our students to do anyway. Um, and so this is more of the same uh, from this particular graphic. But another big thing here is to recognize that this idea of colorblindness, that is another form of racism in and of itself. Because what, you know, they, these folks would have, what would have us do is, you know, shut up, go back to the way things were before, you know, we were able to say the word systemic racism and not be met with like, <gasps> You know, it'd be the days before companies were um, vowing to devote funds and times and, and hire companies like mine, um, they want to, we, we have to recognize that colorblindness is a form of racism, period. Like, you, we have to acknowledge our history and, 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 and resist the idea that people who talk about racism and speak truth to power are not the racist. Like, that sets backwards. Calling out racism is not racist. Okay, and so finally, what can you as parents and educators do? So like I said, educate yourself first. And so one of the things I did when I started the company was start a YouTube channel that has tons of um, free videos. They're short, um, most of them are about five minutes long. They just provide these um, these like brief histories and tips and, and, and definitions and ways of thinking about these issues that are accessible for for parents and teachers and, and things that you can show in your classroom for students. Um, and so if you're a part of an organization um, and you have a little bit more of a budget than YouTube, then of course we, uh, my, my team and I, we offer these services for organizations and schools. Um, I have a team of about eight wonderful consultants, uh, teachers and all kinds of wonderful backgrounds. And yeah, this is how you can keep in touch with us. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. And, um, now, Brandy touched on the, the national perspective, overarching perspective of what's going on in the classroom. Um, but I don't want to also lose sight of the fact that this is affecting us directly here locally. Um, one of the people that's continually pushing um, this rhetoric, Christopher Rufo, um, actually paid for uh, an ad in local newspapers, at least in Webster and, and in Penfield. Um, that called uh, uh, basically what, what amounts to a call to arms, indicating that not only are they against CRT, but that CRT is just one form of evil and that um, teaching racial equity is also evil. Um, flat out, that's what it indicated. That's what it said in, in the local um, paper that he took out the ad in. So speaking to the local effect of what's going on here in town, um, Please continue to submit your questions to the Q&A, um, but Shane is gonna to touch on some of the local issues that's affecting us. Thank you, Duane. And it's really an honor to be on this panel with the speakers who have come before me and to learn from them and share a little bit about how we're doing um, some of this work here in Rochester. We're not doing critical race theory. We are doing culturally responsive education at the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project but it is telling a fuller story about what's happened in our community, about some of the causes of the inequity we see, especially related to race and helping kids and teachers think about this, draw their own conclusions about it, decide um, in informed ways how they want to address these issues um, and do it in a way where curiosity and honesty and respect are a part of these kinds of conversations. Um, one thing I do want to say first is my co-lead at the project, uh, Keisha James, was supposed to be speaking tonight, but she had a family member come up, uh, a family issue come up and asked me to come in her stead. So I'm happy to be here, but I'm sorry that you won't be meeting Keisha. 
but hopefully you'll see both of us at a community event around Rochester, uh, where we're often speaking and sharing um, some of this history, that are just not just curriculum that we use with kids, but for parents. This is the amazing team of teachers that we work with. We just hired eight new teachers to help us write more curriculum and facilitate discussion. Um, our project um, is about a four-year project. We've developed curriculum on a local history of racist policy and resistance from the 30s to present day in grades 4, 8, and 12. Also, we've created a curriculum on enslavement, particularly in upstate New York, um, and the ways people of color have resisted, which includes terms like enslaver, enslaved, freedom seeker, some of what Brandy was, Brandy was talking about. And currently, we're writing um, lessons and resources for teachers in grade two around identity through the story of Constance Mitchell, and in grade five, helping tell the story of Latino civil rights here in Rochester. And everything we do is completely free. It's open source. Soon it will be published on a big website with RIT that anyone can access, use, and adapt. And it's our goal to work with school districts all across Monroe County to help them take our resources, adapt them for the unique needs of their schools and their students, to help use our inquiries and resources and primary sources to help tell this bigger story. And um, we actually have trained over 800 teachers on our half-day training or in over 10 school districts where we've engaged teachers and district leaders. And we also do community training where in the last year we've had over 3,000 individuals attend our public presentations and public curriculum sessions for adults and for parents who wanna learn more about what this is doing in our community and how they can be a part of the solution. Everything that we do though, uh, is co-written, vetted, and paid for with the students of Teen Empowerment. Over 30 youth over the last three years have helped choose the resources that I'm going to show you today, have helped us write and vet this curriculum each summer, and it's been really incredible to learn from these youth who are active in the current civil rights movement, as well as living in the neighborhoods that are often specifically focused on in the curriculum. Um, and everything also is informed by our elders. The teachers and educators who have come before us, like Hannah Storrs, who challenged racist textbooks and was one of the first black teachers, Dr. Walter Cooper, who sued the city school district over school segregation, was a New York State regent, integrated the town of Henrietta, and actually served on our advisory board. And Principal uh, Dr. Alice Holloway Young, who's also a great friend of our project, who fought the Ku Klux Klan, was the first uh, black principal in Monroe County, integrated the 19th Ward. And it's in the legacy of these folks, their stories that we're trying to carry this work that is not new work, but very much old work that people of color in our community have always been doing. And it's the legacy that Keisha and I are trying to carry forward. But it's not just us, all of our work is advised by an incredible group of community members, past and present civil rights leaders, school district leaders, New York State regents, um, deans of schools of education. And we're really lucky to have their advisement and input in everything that we do. Everything that we do is also independently funded so that everything we do can be free. We're not funded by Pastone, we're just our host, but we are funded by United Way, ESL, the Community Foundation, and a number of other generous funders, some of whom actively participated in redlining uh, in our community and are seeking to address some of that story through this work. And that's allowing us to pay teachers to facilitate these conversations and offer free curriculum resources for districts to adapt and use. Everything else is also informed by the New York State Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education Framework that was approved by the New York State Board of Regents. And every school district has actively been talking to their teachers about and is supposed to be implementing and incorporating into the structure of their schools as well as their curriculums, noticing these four pillars of welcoming and affirming environments that incorporate social emotional learning, like our project does, materials that represent and affirm student identities, including where they live, uh, inclusive curriculum that's written by students, as is ours, and by a diverse team of educators. Also, helping kids critically examine power structures to think not just about something like individual racism, but to think about it in a structural way, um, to help kids engage in projects on issues that they determine are important related to social justice, where they can take leadership, um, and understand and be curious about the stories of people who are different from them who maybe have experienced uh, different histories uh, and different uh, uh, forms of racism and inequality in the community, and to learn how to talk about it, to think about it, and be a part of creating change if they choose. Finally, everything we're doing is also directly informed by the social studies standards in New York State, as well as the social studies practices um, here in New York State. 
um, that every single one of our lessons is directly connected to to help teachers teach good social studies and historical practice. Um, so what we do is absolutely not a lecture. It's not indoctrination. Instead, it's helping teachers guide students to inquiry, especially around this central question. How has racism impacted Monroe County? Notice how open-ended that is. And how have people responded? Also, please notice how open-ended that is and how many different ways people could respond to this question. We use something called the boxing protocol to help students think through this. We go through three rounds of sources. And today I'm gonna to just do some quick exposure for you, show you three rounds of our sources at a bunch of our different grade levels. So you can have like an actual look at what several thousand students over the last year actually participated in in their classrooms here in Monroe County. This is what our curriculum looks like. Anyone can look at it, examine it, adapt it, and use it. Um, we start with restorative circles, helping kids uh, consider some definitions from that culture responsive framework, craft their own definitions, look at local examples. And then three days of our unit are dug deep into that uh, inquiry boxing protocol, where they look at local primary sources to help answer our inquiry question. And then finally, students have a chance to unpack that learning and draw on the ways that people of color and their allies in Rochester sought to create change to think about how they themselves might want to create change in our communities. We start our lessons by inviting teachers to use restorative practices, supporting students' social emotional learning, to ask them what do they know, what have they experienced when it comes to racism, giving them group norms and agreements to help think about and agree to, to learn how to have this conversation in a safe and supportive way. We offer definitions for students to consider based on that culturally responsive framework. We tie the words racist and anti-racist um, to uh, adjectives, describing actions, describing a policy or a behavior. So for anti-racist, believing and acting as if racial groups are equals and actively resisting racism. Or racist, believing and acting if something is wrong or right, superior or inferior, better or worse about a racial group. And racist policies as a noun with rules, laws that create or keep inequality between racial groups. Kids though then have the opportunity to work with their peers to adjust these definitions, to help them think through it and make them work for their class and their environment. And we also offer this really great um, graphic uh, from Dr. Beverly Tatum, who talks about racism as like a moving walkway in the airport, um, like the destination being systemic racism. The racist is on board with this, that they're demonstrating racist action by actively working towards and walking in the direction of inequality. The passively racist person is me most of my life, standing on that walkway, kind of trying to treat everyone the same, but not really doing anything to dismantle uh, inequality or systemic racism, and ending up in that same destination as that person um, demonstrating racist actions. And finally, um, anti-racist is someone who turns the other way and takes active action like Dr. Cooper or Alice Young or Hannah Storrs did to try to dismantle racism and systemic racism in our communities. We invite students to look at different examples and to draw their own conclusions about what these mean and build the definitions. Like Howard Coles, whose daughter Joan is on our advisory board and is helping us tell her father's story. He edited the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper and called out redlining in the 1930s and fought against housing discrimination all the way into the 90s both in his newspaper, through protests, through even getting hired as a real estate agent and breaking the law and showing black people homes in white neighborhoods. Um, in 12th grade, we talk about this. This is not for fourth graders, but until 1968, many schools, churches, clubs, businesses all across Monroe County demonstrated racist actions when they held their annual blackface minstrel shows. White students painted on blackface and they sung racist songs, mocked the intelligence of black people and sent a clear message of who was allowed in these schools and in these towns. The Brighton Central School District had one of these every year. The Penfield Central School District had these every year, including an Indian Landing Elementary School where fourth and fifth graders would dress up in blackface. As well, these were in the city school districts, West Irondequoit, Greece. Every single school district hosted those shows and demonstrated those racist actions. And then finally, a racist policy. Kodak and actually the Monroe County Legislature made it a policy on the homes that they built or owned that they would actually put racial covenants specifically barring people of color from legally owning or occupying those homes. So this is the second day of our unit. Uh, this, this is for fourth grade. We invite students to learn about inquiry through the inquiry protocols, noticing, wondering, and inferencing, and invite them to help think about the data they're about to look at, 
what does it tell us about Monroe County? We don't tell them about the source that they're about to look at. Instead, we say we're going to use our New York State social studies practices. We're going to gather, use, interpret some evidence using our inquiry protocol to kind of think about what we're looking at here. And slowly, kids start to observe. They notice these different colored dots. Kids see streets, sometimes streets they live on. They notice lots of blue dots in one area, uh, white space, very few green dots, except for over in this middle part. They look at the next part of the community and see a lot more blue dots. They start making inferences, drawing conclusions, wondering about what these things are, sharing their thinking, and then finally noticing the city of Rochester and realizing there's a really significant difference between the city and the suburbs. And thinking, okay, when and where is this? This is Monroe County. Maybe this must be. My fourth graders always say during this activity, this must be Martin Luther King times. This must be a really, really long time ago. Um, and then we show them the key and they realize this is actually not housing, this is uh, individuals based on race or demographics. They, and a lot of kids start having strong reactions and big wonders about how we got there, noticing barriers uh, like highways, the inner and outer loops separating different communities or the way waterways separate communities. We show them this is 2010 and that the 2020 data is exactly the same. And then we invite kids to draw their own conclusions. What does this make you think about Monroe County? And often the conclusion is segregation is a really big problem in this community. And they want to know why. How did we get to this place? How did I not realize this? And kids sometimes look around their classroom and realize, oh, there are no students of color in my classroom. That was almost every class I took growing up in Webster schools. Um, and they start to wonder, how did this get to be? They look at other census data, like home ownership rates in Monroe County, noticing significant disparities between Black, Latino, and white in our community, as well as Asian. Noticing that in Rochester, New York, we have the most segregated school, di school district borders in the country. The town of Penfield and the city school district have the most segregated school district border in the country. The town of Brighton is the number six most segregated school district in the country. And Western Rondequoit's number seven. Kids are shocked to learn about this or to realize that in our community, uh, outside of the city, 98% of teachers are white. And they're starting to realize, okay, so this is the reality. And then what does this mean? Is this a problem? What feelings are coming up? How did we get to this kind of place? They share those notices and wonders and big pieces of chart paper. They notice how their friends have different notices and wonders. And they start to build common understandings and questions and start to work towards living out these words of Jane Baldwin, participating in the purpose of education, which is to create in the person the ability to look at the world for himself and to make his own decisions about what it means. So the next thing we do is we look at a federal policy, the created redlining. We use a New York State social studies practice of comparing and contrasting. We start by looking at different neighborhoods, focus in on four neighborhoods. What's different about a rendezvous in the seventh ward or Beachwood in Brighton? What is the difference when it comes to racial demographics? How did we get to this place? And we start by analyzing our common source, the red line map, and showing kids each part of this map and the tools that created it and the federal policy that created it. And then we give them social studies superheroes to help them think critically about this source so that they can keep working towards strong conclusions about our inquiry question. Kids share their notices and wonders. What do the colors mean? What do the different spaces mean? Where are their neighborhoods? We give them the key, showing them that red areas mean hazardous, and the government deemed blue and green areas as best, and yellow areas as declining. And kids wonder, why is my neighborhood best? Why is the neighborhood in the city hazardous? Or why is the black neighborhood called hazardous? And why is the white neighborhood called best? And then we look at the actual policy. This is what we show 12th graders for fourth graders. We do a summary in fourth grade language. But this is the actual language that made this map of Rochester and hundreds of maps across the country. It explicitly says that a best area is an area where occupants are of the same social and racial class or white. That an area can get a good rating if a highway is built to separate inharmonious racial groups. It even says that schools uh, that have incompatible racial elements should be given that hazardous rating. We show them that these are the people who made this law. What do you notice about this law and who these men are? What do you notice about whose voices are missing? And they start to notice they're all men, they're all wealthy. There's no women there. There's no people of color there. There's no Latino people there, Asian or black. 
And they're starting to wonder about this and then draw some conclusions between this language and the people that wrote it. We let them look at actual neighborhoods in our community and see what the government agents wrote about the neighborhoods that gave them their ratings. These are primary sources. You'll notice that the town of Irondequoit rated best because it was 0% black. The seventh word was rated hazardous because it was 10% um, black as well as 40% Italian and Jewish, which in the 30s was also deemed less than white uh, or less than full citizen in our community. Then students are each given a different superhero role. They take this whole source together as a handout. And with their superhero role, each kid takes on a different task. One kid thinking about, is this credible? What do we know about who made it? Can we trust this? Is this real? Could this give us some answers to our question, how has racism impacted our community? How do people respond? Mr. E asks, whose voice is missing? What type of document is this? Uh, what's the purpose of this? The connector thinks about the main idea, the larger issues, and Captain Context thinks about when it was written and what we know about this period of time. And together, the kids share their different roles and start to get closer to answering that inquiry question, sharing their notes, using restorative practices to start to think about what this source tells us about this inquiry question. The teacher is not lecturing, instead, they're facilitating conversation based on this text. Finally, on the last day, kids are given a jigsaw. Each kid gets a different primary source that shows a racist policy and people who responded to it. So for example, uh, the Coopers were not allowed to live where they wanted. They looked at 69 apartments in Monroe County and were refused based on race of every single one. In 1958, they organized with their friends at the NAACP and became the first black family to own a home in the town of Henrietta. By 1960, Henrietta was the most integrated suburb of Rochester with just 11 individual people of color, thanks to Dr. Walter Cooper, who's still a good friend and on our advisory board, and they get to learn more about his story in fourth grade. For the story of Ellen Stubbs, uh, who found some friends in the legal establishment to help her sue for the right to live in her home in Greece in 1963 to integrate that town. For Judge Davis, who fought against Nathanael, who refused to sell him a home in the 19th Ward because of his skin color, and because on this home, and this is the actual home, it explicitly said it could never be occupied by any person who was black. And it uses a little bit harsher language. We show this to our eighth grade students. Same with Principal Alice Holloway Young, who fought the Ku Klux Klan. Notice this is East Rochester High School's football field, where over 8,000 Klansmen have gathered in their robes to burn three 50-foot high white crosses in celebration of white supremacy. And the students learn how Alice Young fought them successfully and integrated the 19th Ward. And this picture really reminds me of um, what we saw from Janelle in the beginning about parents protesting against integration. And I was taught about that in the South, but growing up in Webster, I never knew this happened in Webster and in the city. Look at 1971, thousands of parents holding up signs to keep students of color out of their schools. You compare a picture like the Little Rock Nine to Rochester in 1971, where white parents led by Klan member Mary McAleese we're throwing rocks and bricks at black students who are attempting to integrate Charlotte High School. And then they learn the stories of students of color like James Beard and the Black Student Union that organized to fight school segregation in Rochester and our schools. And the ways these white parents actually won. And today in our community, we have three of the most segregated school districts in the entire country. In grade 12, students investigate the stories of people of color who faced issues with policing in our community, like Rufus Farewell, who was beaten within an inch of his life while in police custody, um, and the march that he helped lead on City Hall, or how Malcolm X came to Rochester uh, and helped lead protests against police brutality and get a police accountability board form. They learn about all these different things. They have the chance to think about how they're feeling, talk about uh, where they're at and what they need to stay with this conversation, take a break or to move forward, and to support each other as they learn about this history so that they can create a change if they choose. Students are invited to participate in restorative circles where they can share their feelings, respond to that central inquiry question, also using a structured circle protocol uh, with a partnership over with Peary who helps us with our restorative circles. And finally, students have a chance to take action. Students have the option to share a problem that they see in their community that they would like to address. The students in my school uh, we're really upset that we didn't have any Black teachers. And so these three students in my classroom, I'm not sure if this is going to load, um, they actually, they met with the principal and 
They got three friends together. They met with the principal. They said, we have no black teachers in our school. There's only 11 in our whole district. There's 550 white teachers. There's only 98% of teachers in Monroe County are white. This needs to change. Why aren't you hiring black teachers? And the principal didn't know what to say, so we let them talk to the school board and to talk to other district leaders who responded to these fourth graders and changed our district policy and have increased the number of Black teachers that have been hired because these students talked about something they cared about. They were armed with language to help them think about it. They saw themselves in local examples of Alice Young who took similar action and decided they chose, wanted to carry on that legacy. They did all of it with parent permission. They did all of it um, on their own and with just teacher support and facilitation. And it's a really incredibly powerful project that we hope students all across Monroe County will have the opportunity to participate in challenging the issues that they see, having language to name those different things and to find ways to follow the examples of people who look like them, who organize to create change and to create a more just and equitable Monroe County. Everything we do, like we said, is designed in a way that is not indoctrination. Instead, it is inquiry, it is primary source based, it is historically based and rooted in that New York State culturally responsive framework and just a tool to help students think critically, help teachers learn how to talk to students about this. And what we would absolutely love to do is to come and work with your school district. We're in half the school districts right now, and we would love to come and work in your school districts to work with your district leaders and teachers with our free trainings and to adapt our resources to meet their specific needs. And a big reason we're in so many schools is because thousands of parents have written letters to their school district leaders saying, you know what, it's really important to us that our kids learn this truth. And they've raised their voices louder than some of those parents that we saw in, in many of the previous presenters who have been pushing back against telling some of the truth about history and helping kids learn how to talk about it and think about it. So I think I've talked a little too long here, but I wanna say thank you for having me and I'm really excited for questions and please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll share my contact info and particular resources in the chat in just a second. I'll turn it back over to Dwayne. Thank you all. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists. Um, wonderful job, wonderful job. And now comes the fun part, some questions. Um, being educators, what type of pushbacks have you seen directly from parents um, or administrators? And how can those parents that are advocates for some of these um, programs being implemented or more fully implemented in their children's schools, how can they become an advocate and reach out to those um, that are um, doing the work? Because oftentimes I found that um, the, the, the loud and wrong uh, are the ones you hear from and not necessarily those that are on your side. Um, I can take a stab at that uh, question. <clears throat> well, I, I think first of all, I mean, parents are um, perhaps the most critical constituent when it comes to um, K-12 public education. Um, it is their children that we are educating. And um, parents who uh, are interested in making sure that their children are being educated in such a way that they are engaged and that they are learning about their own lived experience and in so doing increasing achievement um, because that is a natural uh, flow from this type of work, um, need to um, engage their school board members. They need to um, engage with parent councils. I know here in the city school district, we have um, the parent advisory council and that serves as an advisory body to the board. Um, I would imagine that most districts would have a similar organization or a similar branch of uh, essentially governance um, because they can bring their concerns to the board. Um, we've seen all across the country on the news uh, with parents that are extremely vocal in school districts in Florida around uh, masking mandates and all of that. If, if only our parents who are um, interested in making sure that this work gets moved forward would come to the table in the same manner, uh, we would see change. I mean, really, it's conflict that demands change. And until uh, we have that groundswell, um, 
this is likely to just be a, uh, it's going to move forward, but it will be in a trickling manner. Now, there was something that, um, one of the questions that, that came in, or um, there's something that um, Brandy, you, you spoke about here as far as co-opting terms and propaganda. Um, one of the most co-opted terms out there um, it, it comes from Martin Luther King Jr. when he talks about not being judged by the color of your skin, but the content of the character. Can you speak to the importance of um, really owning the language and pointing out um, the fallacy in thinking that the way to correct um, anti, the, the way to correct racist behavior or racist policies is to have race neutral policies? Absolutely, absolutely. And so, and you see the same co-optation happening with the term social justice warrior. Now that's now that's a, a dirty word. Uh, for, for some reason, we've kind of let the, the right have that. And so I think that we should resist um, for sure and not, you know, not falling into the trap of thinking that if we just adjust our language that they all change their strategy or if we somehow you know engage in a strategy of appeasement that will somehow come to a place where you know things will be all right like no like this is a, a, a moment of reckoning in our country uh we, we saw on january 6th that like folks are folks are fired up and this is one of the, those issues that you know especially when you put the people's kids on the lines and in, in, in the midst of all this racial tension um, and so I think it's 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 wrong headed to think that if we, you know, avoid and kind of, you know, I guess like go backwards or take our foot off the pedal, that that is somehow going to help things. Because in fact, what we what we saw over the Obama administration and since then is that this is this is getting worse, y'all. Like, um, and you know, I think what happened with George Floyd, um, his murder was a, a watershed moment in the, you know, conviction of of his murderer. But you know, it, this 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 the idea that if we stop now, that like somehow like the 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 cat can go back, or the rabbit can go back into the hat, or whatever it is, you can't unring that. You can't unring this bell. And so what we need to do is stand firm in our in our conviction. So. I don't want to challenge you too much, Shane, but I think a lot of what you said is critical race, is teaching critical race theory in schools. And I, and I know it's like a bad, you know, we don't want to say that. We don't want to name that because that's what the, that's what the, the, the rallying cry, the enemy is saying, oh, you're doing a bad thing. But like so many of the elements, you know, it's just of, of critical race theory is getting people to question question policies, question laws, question histories. And it sounds like you're giving your students those tools that they need to do that. And so I get it, you know, educators, we are constantly on the chopping block and constantly scapegoated in these things and people got to protect their jobs. So sometimes we got to say, we got to say in order to, you know, do what we have to do. But I think um, in general, I would, I tend towards pushing the envelope and say, okay, so what if we are, now what? Um, as opposed to, you know, saying, oh, no, 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 we're not, because what they're what these people really are mad at is any conversation about race. That, you know, critical race, they, didn't, they wouldn't even be able to define it or point to it, if not for cheat sheets that, you know, <laughs> folks are putting together. So that's my take. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yes. And, and, and following up off of that, um, it's not only talking about race, but any type of critical thinking uh, within itself. And, and Shane and, and, and Janelle, if you can address this, um, for instance, uh, um, the New Deal carved out exceptions for domestic workers and farmers. Now, if you're sitting in class and you just point that out and then you keep going and you never try to challenge the students as to why or what was going on in that time or who did that represent, and you, now you're just talking, talking about disparate um, um, treatment, and the outcomes of it. So is it is it both? Is it an attack on ra um, teaching racism, real racism, what, what really occurred, real history, and also an attack on um, having children be able to think critically about issues? I'm sorry, either Janelle or Shane on that one. Uh -huh. Shane, did you want to start? And Take it away, Janelle. I, you know, what I would add actually, Dwayne, to that is that it's also an attack on public education. 
Um, I just keep thinking of the video uh, the Miss Osmo Osmo Wade showed of the the educator who ended up quitting her job. Um, and I mentioned the Arizona law that will fine school districts five thousand dollars. And originally, the fine was targeted towards individual teachers. Um, so I, I agree. I agree with um, uh, uh, the er er earlier comment that. Uh, they don't want any kind of discussion or acknowledgement of racism. And, and believe me, uh, no one would love to be in a society where we didn't have racism and more than people who are directly impacted it, by it, right? But we, we are living in a society where racism is very pervasive. And avoiding it, uh, as was also noted, um, it isn't going to make it go away. It's still going to be there, if not worsened by ignoring its its actual presence. And so I think that it it is an attempt to try to ignore it. It is an attempt to uh, fight back and against the the racial reckoning that we all experience. But like post reconstruction uh, and post Brown, it is an attack on public education itself. Um, formerly, so, and I'm just going to say very briefly some history, like, you know, uh, enslaved Black people, it, it was a crime to learn how to read or write. Accessing education was criminalized. And so emancipated Black people actually led the fight for the creation of the modern day public education system. Uh, Black congressmen who were elected uh, went home and worked in their home states to create education clauses in state constitutions. It actually became a requirement for readmission to the union post-Civil War that you had to add an education clause in your state constitution. So uh, emancipated Black people led and in, in helped to establish the public education system, but redemption, or I'm sorry, reconstruction was truncated by this movement called redemption that uh, where a lot of white people sought to strip black people of the rights that they had gained and citizenship, including access to education. And then post Brown, we saw the same kind of backlash. I mentioned defunding of a lot of public schools, but also the creation of these all white academies and in vouchers, frankly, right? And, and that was the root of, of voucher and privatization in those systems. Uh, and, and a lot of these uh, offshoots have perpetuated segregation, uh, but there's also, again, the movement away and undermining of public education itself as a public good. And, and I mentioned before, I, I don't think that it's a coincidence that we also have attacks on democracy at the same time. And I'll add something else too. I think that it is important. There's a question in the chat about, um, there's a lot of parents who are concerned that talking about racism in the classroom will make white kids feel guilty. Um, and that's certainly a concern that I hear from a lot of parents um, or that fourth grade is too young to talk about racism with students. And my response is often, well, there's no fourth grader who's a person of color who doesn't know what racism is, hasn't had experiences with it. And every time we have that introduction circle in my class, there are quite a few stories told and questions that kids have. And it's really meaningful and important to have that. When I taught first grade, I had a number of first graders tell me about being called the N-word, about having rocks thrown at them because of how they looked or because they wore a hijab or all kinds of things where it's like, it's happening to our kids. And it might not be happening to white kids, but it's happening to their peers and they're seeing it and they're witnessing it on the bus or the bus stop. And we need to make sure we're challenging and addressing that with students. And if it's if kids are feeling guilty, I know for me, sometimes I have felt guilty when I think about this, the ways I've explicitly benefited from things like redlining. But when I think about that, the goal for us is not guilt at all or to make kids feel bad, but in CAD to make kids understand history, understand their stories better, to have conversations with their friends and parents and their teachers about this. And then to think about, okay, how can we be empowered to move forward and create anti-racist change? If this is a problem that I feel concerned about, let's turn that into action, into empowerment, 
So that's the most important thing that we do. But also we have social emotional learning supports built into every single day of our lessons to make sure that kids' feelings are shared, that a kid who is feeling upset, whether they're white or black, Latino or Asian, have that chance to be heard and understood and a safe place to ask those questions so that they can move towards creating equity. I think that's a really big hope for us. And there was one other question in the chat for me that was about- Before, hold on, Shane, I'm sorry, yep. before you move on to the other question, I would just like to say that um, part of being a parent and part of being any uh, just um, a, uh, empathetic human being is to understand that if you're thinking that your child is too young to talk about race, well, my child is too young to experience racism, but it happens. So if, if, if that same type of empathy, if that same type of caring is not, you know, um, bestowed upon my child, then there's something wrong and there's something broken there. So we can't be so um, quick to shield because all you're doing is crippling. So good. Thanks for sharing that point. And you were going to discuss the second question in the chat? Oh, there was a question about a book called Something Happened in Our Town that addresses um, a police killing of a person of color in police custody uh, or an officer-involved shooting or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that book, I think, is a pretty solid book that uh, I haven't particularly used in my classroom. It's not a part of our curriculum. Someone in the question said that was in our curriculum. It's not. Um, and we don't have particular conversations about public safety in our fourth grade curriculum, but often kids bring that up in restorative circles and in conversation and we give resources for teachers to think about that. I know some teachers who have very successfully use that in their classroom to have a more nuanced conversation, but nowhere are we encouraging teachers to tell kids to not trust the police or to trust the police. It's not a teacher's job to do that. It's to help foster those kinds of conversations, understand where kids are coming from, and share facts with them to help them think through it. And then to connect with the parents, say your kid had this question. I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. Here's what we, we talked about in class, and I hope you have a good conversation about this at home. But that's just the response to that question that was there in the chat. And this question came in earlier, um, and it was for Janelle. Um, it discussed um, strategic placing of Black people um, in white-led movements to suppress CRT. And how do we respond to those who claim those are the quote-unquote correct Black people? I think we have to think how we focus our energy and focusing our energy on educating ourselves, um, going to some of these school board meetings, engaging, sharing information. I think that that's a great use of our energy rather than trying to get lost in back and forth um, with, with folks who just aren't really interested in learning or resolving anything, but just who, who want to engage, um, you know, in that kind of back and forth, right? How can we educate each other, educate ourselves, share information, and show up at some of these meetings, right? Uh, whether a, school, a local school board meeting, uh, writing to a state legislator, engaging with them, uh, even engaging at the federal level as well, because this is all making its way uh, to the top too. Um, but I, I think it's harder to get bogged down in just like a back and forth, right? I, I take the tact that um, you attract more flies with honey. Uh, and um, I think, you know, when I talked about um, what's in a name, really, I think people get bogged down in the rhetoric. Um, and um, while I think the words that we choose are, they are important um, and they serve different purposes for different people in different groups. Um, and I just think that when it comes to this discussion about K-12 education, what we're really doing is teaching students how to think critically about their own lived experience, whether you're white, black, Asian, um, you know, or otherwise, it's, it's, it's all the same work. Uh, in my view. And I think that when you ask a teacher 
who's struggling with classroom management, uh, would you like to be able to have a better handle on your students in the classroom? Would you like to see your students' eyes light up when you begin a lesson? Um, would you like to see your students become excited about what they're doing? Um, and so that there isn't boredom, so there isn't, you know, all of this dead time where students, uh, you know, are acting up or not feeling like this lesson is about them. And if the answer to that is yes, then eventually you're going to get to critical race theory. Um, but you have to start somewhere with, with, with the softball, I, I think, um, especially for folks who are just really struggling with embracing these concepts. And we're, we're gonna continue with the questions. Um, those that wanna continue on in, in the chat, can please can feel free to continue to pose your questions. I just wanted to give the second code for the CLE. It's 4940. That's 4940, and it will be placed in the chat as well. Um, one of the questions that came up, and it was in regards to um, being colorblind and whether or not that's, a, that's being racist. Um, and the question asks, how should they approach or interact with Black people if they can't approach them as what they are, just people? So who would like to take that one? Uh, I'll take that one since I think I was the one who said that. Um, so I think, and just so so to clarify, how this normally plays out is people say, "Oh, I don't see color." I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just like Martin Luther King. You know, content of 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 one's character instead of the color of one's skin. And I think for most people, it is coming from a a well intended place, but um, in reality, how it plays out is as a form of racial gaslighting. So um, a person of color brings up an issue of race or something related to you know, their racial identity. And then a white person responds, oh, I don't see color. So, which, which is completely invalidating to that person's lived experience. And so there's a difference between treating someone like a stereotype or treating someone, you know, not like, you know, an individual versus ignoring a fundamental characteristic about them that matters. Like, I like being black. I don't want you to pretend you don't see that fact. And it's like kind of insulting to one's intelligence to pretend that, you know, regardless of our intelligence, intentions uh, that we, A, you know, just can't see color unless we have some kind of issue with our vision, but that also we, we can't acknowledge the, the, the very different um, histories and cultures that we, we have and some of the problems that come up as a result. So it's very dismissive to tell people of color, especially I don't see color. And that is a way of basically silencing people. So, you know, if you're a boss or you're a teacher, you're someone and a person of color is coming to you and, you know, they're sharing that experience and, and you can't relate because you would rather pretend racism doesn't exist that is effectively silencing. Um, and that is a form of racism because that helps to keep racism in place. And is it is it not the fact that part of what, and this is the scholar, scholarly um, CRT, not the bastardized uh, version of what they're trying to say right now, but the scholarly version of CRT looks and examines what is meant by the norm. So when you talk being colorblind, when you're talking about being race neutral, you're talking about some type of norm that exists that is perpetrated and, um, and built off of white supremacy, i.e. the book, Even the Rat Was White, and trying to really deconstruct what is going on in society to um, put up what are these normal basis and standards based off of. So um, Janelle, do you want to explore um, that a little bit further in regards to what is meant by the norm? I, I think I can. I, 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 and correct me if if I'm not addressing this, but it's it's kind of these i these pervasive ideas, right? The widespread ideas of or, or what we assume is like a normative, like the baseline. Like why why are we um, uh, constantly looking at a baseline or using uh, quote unquote like a whiteness as the norm, right? And when I say whiteness, again, it's not genetic, uh, like a, a genetic, but like the the presumption, right? Um, but you know, and and I think Brandy emphasizes this as well. What critical race theory says, though, is that this idea of colorblindness is the very thing 
that is really playing a huge role in replicating racial inequality. An example is school segregation. Uh, there was a 2007 case, parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District number one, uh, where Seattle, uh, which is actually my home city, uh, they had never had a, a lawsuit. They, they were being threatened to be sued. So they proactively created a school desegregation program. And then you had uh, Jefferson County in Kentucky that uh, had originally been under a federal desegregation order uh, and continued their program on a voluntary basis. So both of these voluntary desegregation programs were struck down in that 2007 case. Uh, and the Supreme Court said you effectively could not use race conscious school desegregation plans, meaning that considering students race and making student uh, or individual student race and making student assignments. But what we've seen is a increase in segregation. Rates of segregation now rival the rates and in some places are worse than what uh, than what they were at the the time Brown was actually filed, and a lot of school districts that can't use these race conscious approaches have tried to find other ways uh, to promote diversity, uh, but it's difficult. It's difficult to have a racially diverse uh, program when you can't consider race. Right. So that's one way that we have seen this play out. Uh, and I think, as Brandy said, a lot of folks who, who talk about colorblindness may be well intentioned. They, they don't want to uh, act like they're judging someone based on on their perceived race. But, you know, I, I, I think Brandy really addressed it. What you end up doing is really ignoring someone's lived experience and invalidating their own experiences uh, of race. So we, we really do have to think about acknowledging race and the role of, of race, again, perceived race, uh, and, and how this plays out and also how these perceptions have become embedded in law and policy. Now, we also had a question in regards to um, what do you think about exposing the resistors to implicit bias training and if that can soften their resistance? I, is that yeah, the, question, the question was for anyone. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to um, clarify it a little bit further, but those that are resisting um, actual teaching of history, right, or, or the acknowledgement of racism, either um, historically or um, as a social structure, um, how do you deal with those and is simply implicit bias training um, a tool to be used or does it need to be something more proactive? I'm kind of big in the, it's more important that systemic change happens and then attitudes change. People were very resistant to integrated schools and in the South where schools were forced to integrate by the courts, over time, oftentimes those places, it worked out really well. People dropped their bias. James Beard talks about that here at Charlotte High School. There was awful, terrifying protests from white parents, but many of those white and black students became very close friends. And there's lots of great oral history on that. Justin Murphy's publishing a book this spring about the integration in Rochester and the ways that when a policy changes like this, people start to come along. Like, I, I think those kinds of things, when you change a policy, or this is just what's getting taught to students, as it starts to get accepted and over time, I, th I think that makes more sense to start with systems change than just trying to get to every single person. I think there are a lot of people who just don't know a lot of the history. They don't have a lot of the common facts or language to talk about it. And I, I think that can be really helpful for some folks, but the data about specifically implicit bias training isn't always the most positive, but I might, I brand it, go take it away. Yeah. Um, and it's, I wanted to jump in here because this is where this is like my, my, my lane. And I think 
um, that's always the challenge for me, this sort of chicken and egg conversation around like, do you change like systems and do you change policies first or do you change people first? Um, and I know even Rex Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racism, he argues that, you know, you should really focus on changing the policies. But for me as a political scientist and lawyer and all that, I know that policies are made of very much by people. And we have to think about maybe not necessarily getting to everybody, but who are those key decision makers at the top? Because everything starts, you know, a, a lot of things can happen grassroots and, you know, we can protest and turn up, but the whole point is they have a seat at the table to be making decisions. And so if you are a decision maker in a, in a school um, and that's, you know, that goes for the, you know, everyday teachers, but really those, those administrators and people who are making the hiring decisions and all of that, like, you know, I, I hear you. Um, what you were saying before, Yolanda, about, you know, not dragging people into it, but it's like, if we shouldn't be hiring people who are not willing, like that, that's like, you know, the start, start there. So we're not, you know, having to kind of work, try, trying to pull along um, a, a population of people who aren't bought in, as opposed to setting us, setting, you know, your, your schools and your, your, your organizations up for success, and then tying those behaviors, those inclusive behaviors to compensation, to advancement, and making them actually a part of the business case, not just like a cute thing that we say to justify doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, in the institutional context. So I think that it has to be both. And it can't just be sitting and like pontificating about race. Like there needs to be, that needs to be paired with like active strategies um, and like an actual like metrics and not everything we can we can measure in that same way. Like some of it is in how we feel. Like in people of color, like that, that feeling, it matters more than all of your numbers. But numbers can tell you how folks are feeling in some cases. So, you know, doing climate surveys and things like that. And then actually like setting goals to like, and, and using that data to set goals, like how can we fix this? And wh what will it look like? What will, this, what will our classroom sound like when we've got it right? And a lot of these things are just best practices for how to run a good organization in general when it comes down to it. So that that's my soapbox rant. Right. I wanna, we're, we're, we're coming close to the end right now. I wanted to provide you an opportunity, um, each of the panel an opportunity for a final word before we sign off. Um, I wanna thank you once again, um, for being and presenting here. It was very informative and it was a great discussion and something that's needed and hopefully are, is taken beyond um, today's discussion, but um, into all of the school boards and the classrooms uh, moving forward. So we'll go in reverse order of the panel speaking. So Shane, last words. Oh, I just say thank you so much for having me. I learned so much from the other three panelists. I'm really grateful for your work. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We'd love to collaborate with your school district or give you more information about our work and how you can be supportive of, of helping tell a fuller story of our history here in our community and how we can move towards equity. And I'll put my email in the chat and thank you so much. Brandy. Yes, thank you all so much. And if you'd like to reach out to me, I will also put my email address in the chat. And I also put a link to our Anti-Racism Academy YouTube channel where there are some helpful videos, including top five myths and top five facts about racism, where we start talking about things like why color blindness isn't the way to go. Um, and yes, thank you all so much. I've been honored to be on this panel. Yolanda. Yes, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure for me as well. Uh, I am at the Rochester City School District um, and uh, I will make sure that my uh, email address is on my presentation, uh, my slide show and um, make sure that the coordinators have that to send on to you all. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And Janelle? Likewise, just um, thank you all. I've learned a lot from the other panelists and, and thanks to the participants for uh, just being active and engaged. I'm putting a link in the chat. I mentioned Kimberly Crenshaw um, to the African-American Policy Forum. It's the uh, organization that she leads and they have launched a campaign called Truth Be Told. Uh, there are lots of resources on the website. There is also a toolkit on critical race theory that is extremely helpful. It has a lot, just wonderful resources. So if you want to learn more about critical race theory and how to engage, um, it, it's just a great uh, resource and website that I hope you're all able to check out. And thank you all uh, for the work that you do. 
I want to thank the panel, thank the Lawyers Coalition um, for Racial and Social Justice uh, for putting this together. This was a great panel. It was something that's much needed. Uh, as And as with anything else, um, a wound covered up forever will never heal. They can't be truth and reconciliation without truth first. So um, that being said, I implore everyone um, that tuned in to continue to learn about it, continue to learn about CRT, um, dive into it, and see why it's so important that um, we not only set the record straight and get the language right, but also be advocates for your children out there as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.